I'd like to ask you to turn with me to God's holy word we're going to read together from Romans chapter 8. We're going to read from Romans 8, verse 12 through to 39. It's the passage of scripture I'd like to preach from this afternoon. In some ways, it's a fairly lengthy passage. I'll be focusing on certain elements of it rather than every verse. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the, in, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, well, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thus far the reading from God's holy word. May we be blessed and strengthened by it. I'd also like to ask you to turn with me to uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, to Lord Saint number 10. Uh, this is also in your book of praise, the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number 10, which is a scripture lesson on the providence of God. You can find this on page 525, 525 in your book of praise. Now, the Heidelberg Catechism at this point is going through and explaining the different, what we believe and, what that, and the summary of that belief in the Apostles' Creed. Lord's Day 9 deals with the section of I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator, 
of heaven and earth. In this uh, answer, we note that God will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul and will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this life of sorrow. He does so as Almighty God and is willing as a faithful father. Now, what is explained there and mentioned there is really what we know of as the providence of God. And that's what we'll be reading now in Lord's Day 10. Question 27. What do you understand by the providence of God? God's providence is his almighty and ever-present power, whereby, as with his hand, he still upholds heaven and earth and all creatures, and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, indeed all things come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Question 28. What does it benefit us to know that God has created all things and still upholds them by his providence? We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and with a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature shall separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they cannot so much as move. In the sermon that I wish to preach to you now, I will refer from time to time to Lord's Day 10, uh, but it is particularly from Romans chapter 8 that I will be uh, speaking from, preaching from. Brothers and sisters in Christ, to what extent does the level of your thankfulness depend on your external circumstances? To what extent does your thanksgiving to God depend on the blessings or the good things that you currently experience? As I already mentioned this morning, our churches have set this day aside so that we may collectively thank the Lord for what He's given us, that we may also pray to the Lord for His blessing upon our crops and upon the labor of our hands uh, in the year ahead. Now, as such, we would be expected to focus on things such as health and wealth and employment and another relatively good growing year, a growing season for our farmers. We're expected to count our blessings, to count them one by one. We are to acknowledge that the Lord God is the fountain of all good. And we'll do that, and we'll find that there's much to thank God for. But life isn't always good. And in this life, blessing is mixed with suffering, with pain, and with hardship. Uh, we read about that also in Lord's Day 10, which speaks not only of, of rain, but also of drought. Not just fruitful years, but also barren years. Not just health, but also sickness. Not only riches, but also poverty. And it's true. We not only speak here of prosperity, but also adversity. We know it's true. We experience it. And for many of you, this past year has been one where that adversity has reared its head. Where there's been suffering, where there's been grief, where there's been hardship, and where sometimes those things have or do cloud the blessings and the many good things that God gives us. For some of you, there are financial pressures where you're struggling to find work or else where you're struggling to get the employment that you need to pay your bills. For some of you, that suffering has included pain, sickness, and death. Life is hard, and life can be sad. And so where does that leave us? How are we going to deal with this? How does a Christian face hardship and the challenges that are ever-present in this life? What do you make of the call to give thanks when it is hard to focus on those things that you should be thankful for? 
Well, we read together from Romans chapter 8 and also from our Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number 10. And both Romans 8 and Lord's Day 10 acknowledge that Christians do suffer adversity. In fact, Romans 8 goes so far in verse 7, 17 to say that we are expected to suffer. And verse 35 lists some of the sufferings uh, that are common to God's people. Uh, it mentions here uh, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and the sword. And yet, when we read through Romans chapter 8, we find that this is not a, a, a difficult, negative chapter, nor one simply of, of pouring out grief, an outpouring of grief. But, but Romans 8 is actually a, a chapter which, which ends in a, in a tremendous song of praise to God. And a song of praise and a confident confession of faith. That nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's because Romans 8 looks beyond the suffering in this life to the glory that is to come. But not only that, Romans 8 also looks at what God is doing through our suffering. Because far from being a helpless bystander, far from being a distant, dispassionate God, our Lord is there in the midst of suffering and He is sovereign, He is all-powerful. And He assures us that nothing shall separate us from His love in Christ Jesus. That's what I wish to preach to you about this afternoon. I preach to you God's Word from Romans 8 in con connection with what we confess about the providence of God. I have this theme. It is because of God's sovereign love that we can give thanks in all of life. It is because of God's sovereign love that we can give thanks in all of life. Two points then. First, thanks in the midst of suffering. And secondly, thanks in the hope of glory. Well, suffering is nothing new. The cries and the tears of mankind have gone up to God since the beginning, since the fall into sin. The Old Testament speaks about men such as Job, who suffered terribly. It uh, speaks and narrates stories of people suffering in times of war, in times of famine. It gives us psalms that are cries of lamentation to God. And some of these psalms that really also wrestle with the grief and the suffering which one is experiencing. And some even ask where God is. Psalm 22, for example, uh, verse 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry out in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. It's Psalm 22. We understand that. We understand such cries from the heart. We can feel for this psalm writer who, in unspeakable anguish, cries out, Where are you, God? Why don't you help us? Don't you see us in our pain and in our suffering? We feel for this psalm writer, who's David, because many times we feel the same way. Now, suffering is something which we really wrestle with. And everybody does. And the problem with pain and suffering, if I can call it that, has been answered by different people in various ways. There are some, and now I'm not talking about believers, there are some who leave all things to chance. That's why Laws of 10 also says that things don't come by chance, but also by his fatherly hand. But the issue here is that things don't, that, that people, some people do believe that things just happen by chance. For them, there's no rhyme, there's no re reason to things that happen to us. These are just the sad facts of life. You either get it lucky, or you don't. For others, there is the idea that, well, everything is really very good in the world, except there are bad people who do bad things. That leads to suffering. Uh, for some, in some cultures and some nations, that would include things such as witchcraft and things which others would do against them. Uh, in other circumstances, in other cultures, it is really just the, th the, thing, the fact that, that others have, have caused things to happen which have a very negative impact on us. And that's why we're upset, and that's why we suffer, and we get angry at such people. 
Still other people have the idea of karma. The idea that the suffering inflicted on you is the result of something that you or someone close to you has done in the past. Now these are not good, right explanations of suffering. But even amongst Christians, there are different reasons given for the suffering we endure. There are some who will say that your suffering is always the direct result of sin, and normally your own sin. And so if you're struggling with something, you're going to have to confess that sin and then everything will be all right. Others will blame it on the presence of demons, evil spirits, and these demons or evil spirits need to be disarmed or cast out. And still others will say that if you have a serious illness, cancer for example, and God is not hearing your prayers and healing you, well then there must be something wrong with you. Once again, either an unconfessed sin or you simply just have a lack of faith. But the Bible teaches us something else. In fact, the Bible makes it very, very clear that Christians also will suffer in this life. Although it is true that sin will often lead to suffering, this does not mean that all suffering is the direct result of personal sin. To the contrary, as the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, Christians will even be called to suffer for doing what is right. And in a way that we cannot fully understand, the Bible also teaches us that somehow God is using our suffering to bring us closer to Him and even share in the sufferings of Christ. So rather than say that your suffering is necessarily a result of your sin or of your weakness or of, uh, of, of that sort of a nature, the Bible actually says that God He's going to use this suffering. And you can expect this suffering in this world as he draws you to himself. Romans chapter 8, 16 and 17 says this. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, the suffering we experience with him, with Christ, is pretty much the suffering that Christians endure for the sake of the gospel. And the Bible speaks here about the kind of suffer this kind of suffering more often. It points out that when we suffer for the sake of the gospel, then we share in the fellowship of Christ's suffering, bringing us closer to him and conforming us to be ever more like him. And so some suffering indeed is as a result of persecution and as a result of us seeking to do right and honoring God and obeying Him rather than man. But if you go through Romans 8, you'll recognize that it's not only this kind of suffering that Paul is referring to here. And the next verse, verse 18, it speaks more generally about suffering when it speaks about the sufferings of this present time. And reading that in the context of the following verses, this would imply that Paul means here all sorts of suffering. And so Christians too will suffer. They will suffer for the sake of Christ. They will suffer on account of sin, whether it's your own sin or the sin of others. And they will suffer because we fall, live in a fallen world. We live a life that the prayer in our form for baptism calls no more than a constant death. And the Bible doesn't hide us from these things. And when we read in Romans chapter 8 then that Christians can be expected to suffer, there's something liberating about this. Because what it means here is that when you are faced with suffering and when you are going through grief, yes, also extreme grief, this does not mean that your suffering is a sign of God's displeasure. And this does not mean that God is somehow absent and He's far removed from you and from, from your life. It doesn't mean he's angry with you. It does not mean you've necessarily done something wrong. It does not mean that your faith is too weak. 
The fact of the matter is that Christians too will experience sufferings in this present time, and sometimes that suffering is going to be hard. But that's not all that Paul says in Romans 8. Because before Paul writes about suffering, he writes about something else, and that is sonship. Now, I'd like you to think about that. The, the, the fascinating and the most beautiful connection between what he says about sonship and then what he says about suffering. You see, in our suffering, we very often feel isolated. In our suffering, we'll very often feel abandoned, as if God has left us. But Romans 8 speaks of suffering in the context of being sons, of being children of God. And it is as God's children, as His sons, as His heirs, that we endure suffering in this life. Have another look at Romans chapter 8, 14 to 17. First of all, verse 14. For as many of us, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So it says very clearly here that we are sons of God, that we are children of God. Yes, as we confess in the Lord's Day 9 of our catechism, the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is for the sake of Christ His Son, my God and my Father. And so what Romans 8 is teaching us here is that our bond with God is the closest bond or relationship that you could think of. A relationship that is so close that God is called our Father and that we are declared to be His sons, we are declared to be His children. And by the way, as just as a, as a side note, uh, some people nowadays would complain that he just says sons and doesn't immediately say sons and daughters. Uh, there's a reason why he says sons, and that is because he speaks here also of us being heirs. And it is the son who is the primary heir in those days. And so as one uh, Bible commentator points out, he said, uh, women should be no less upset at this than men should be upset at being called as a church the bride of Christ. It is indeed a beautiful thing to be called sons of God, whether we are male or female. But back to what is spoken of here is that it says here very, very clearly that we have that wonderful relationship with Him. And then look at verse 15 as to how close this relationship is. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And that name Abba, it's a close Name. It's, a, it's an intimate name. It's, it's an Aramaic language. It's an intimate name uh, where uh, a, a small child would, would speak to his father and say, Abba, in a way of, 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 of nearness. And so when we indeed are able to call God our Abba, what this means here is that we recognize him as being a loving father. He's a father not just in name, but what this means is that God is a father in relationship. There's a blessedness in this term. There's a security that goes with us and that stays with us that we may call God Abba. And it's in this context, in the context of God being our father and of us being his sons and his children, that Romans 8 teaches us about the suffering that we endure in this world. And so we learn that when we suffer, we suffer as sons, as God's children. Now, this has two consequences. First of all, since we are God's children, we can come to Him when we suffer, and He will hear us. And not only will He hear us, but He will answer us, and He will even perfect us. Romans 8 verse 23 says that we are groaning. We groan within our souls, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, for the redemption of our body. We're crying out, God, how long do I, is this going to go on for? And we plead with God for relief. And as we pray to God and as we speak to our Father, the Holy Spirit Himself, He takes our prayers and He brings them before the Father. Even more, verse 26, 
Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And verse 27 it says here that he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So, the fact that we are sons who suffer means that God has not abandoned us, that God has not forsaken us, that is not as though he is somehow angry with us and he wants nothing to do with us in our pain and in our suffering. But rather, it is because we are son, sons, God the Holy Spirit, who himself is God, he takes our groanings and he brings them to our Father. And the Father hears them. So that's one consequence of the fact that it is as sons that we suffer. A second consequence. Although the Father does not always take our suffering away, at least not immediately, he does something with it. And then we come to one of the most beautiful, but also one of the most mysterious verses in the Bible. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. All things work together for good. We know that, it says. Oh, not necessarily by experience, but we know it by faith. The suffering we endure is not meaningless, in other words, but your heavenly Father takes it and somehow He uses it. And verse 29 teaches us, He uses it to conform us to the image of His Son. Now, I don't pretend to fully understand it on this side of eternity. I can, of course, point to a number of examples in the Bible where God has clearly worked evil for the good of his children. Uh, the situation of Joseph being sold into slavery in Egypt is a classic example. But I cannot necessarily explain how God is using the suffering and the pain that you might be experiencing now for good. But... If God is your loving Father, if He is the one to whom we may cry out, Abba, Father, and if God is sovereign, if He is almighty, then Romans 8 verse 28 must be true. And this is why we can give thanks also in the midst of suffering. It is because God remains God. Because He's still our Heavenly Father. Because in the end, and in His way, He will even take my suffering and will use it in bringing me, His child, to glory. Brings me to my second point, and that is thanks in the hope of glory. One thing that suffering does do, and He does very well, is it helps us let go of the things of this world and to look forward to that which is to come. The pains of this world remind us that the blessings of this world, blessings of food and family, homes and holidays, crops and cars, these blessings, although good and wonderful in and of themselves, are only temporal blessings to be enjoyed as we look forward to the blessings that are to come. For not only are we sons, Romans 8 says, but we are also heirs, as in H-E-I-R-S. And as heirs, we have an inheritance waiting for us, an inheritance that is so good, so great, that this is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He writes, Romans 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time, and, and Paul had plenty of them. He says, if I'm going to compare them to the glory that is to come, well, it's just not worth even comparing. In other words, even in our suffering, and our suffering even causes us even to look more forward to it, in our suffering we have something to look forward to, something that is yet to come. Come. 
This is not all there is. And as we suffer, we groan for that which is to come. We yearn for that which is still to come. And then see how Paul writes about that groaning in Romans chapter 8, verse 19 and following. In fact, he speaks about three types of groaning. The groaning of creation, our groaning, and the groaning of the Holy Spirit. Uh, first of all, then, uh, the groaning of, of creation, verse 20 to 22. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. See, creation, our whole world around us, it is in decay, it is groaning for that, but in its groaning, it's not the groaning because it's just collapsing, but it's groaning because all, even through the, the things which are happening in the world, in the created world, these are, these are birth pangs as the creation can look forward to the renewal of the earth and at new heavens and at new earth. Then Paul writes of us groaning, verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, that shall, uh, the redemption of our body. And as an aside here, do you notice here it says waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Previously Paul had said we are adopted, now it says we are waiting for the adoption because that which we have will be will have in its completeness at the time of the return of Christ when we may be with him always in eternal heavenly joy and glory when we uh, receive that of which we are heirs now and so creation's groaning eagerly looking forward we are groaning looking forward and then in addition to this groaning, there's also the Holy Spirit groaning on our behalf. Verse 26 again. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. See, we don't always have things clear in our minds. We do not always have that right groaning that is called for as well. And the Holy Spirit then recognizes this. And then it says, the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so creation's groaning, we are groaning, and the Holy Spirit is groaning, and we are all groaning for the same thing. We're all groaning for an end to suffering. We're all groaning, and we are all yearning for that which is to come. But it shall come. Not because we can do it, and not because we are strong, but it will come because God can do it, and because He is strong. Yes, he's sovereign. The providence of God means that God's ever almighty power is such that he will do exactly what he is determined to do. And he will indeed hold on to us in this time of our suffering and he will lead us to glory. And this is why it says here in verse 31, well, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is a question, of course, we cannot answer. Because, of course, there is no one who can be against us if God is for us. Because He is sovereign. He is in control. As with His hand, as we confess in our Lord's Day, as with His hand, He still upholds heaven and earth and all creatures. Yes, as Lord's Day 10 goes on to say, for all creatures are so completely in His hand that without His will, they cannot so much as move. The Lord is able to do what He is determined to do because He is Almighty God. And He's willing to do because He is our faithful Father, because we are sons, because we are children of God. So it says in Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You see, that's why nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. 
neither tribulation nor distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. For in all these things, verse 37 reminds us, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Since God is intent on bringing his children to glory, and since God is all-powerful, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature shall separate us from his love. And we can have a firm confidence that he's going to do what he has promised. And now back to our own lives. And now back to Thanksgiving Day. To what extent does your level of thankfulness depend on your external circumstances? To what extent does your thanksgiving to God depend on the blessings, on the good things that He gives us that you currently experience? Now, the Lord does bless us and He does fill us with many good things. But in His providence, He also sends us adversity. And there are times when we will suffer. So give thanks to God for His goodness. Praise Him for the gifts that He gives you day by day. Thank Him for those things such as food and clothing, a house to live in, a car to drive. Thank Him for the gift of family. Thank Him for the gift of relationships. Thank Him for this nation in which we may live. Thank you for the pleasures that you may have, whether it is going out on holidays or whatever it is that you may be doing. Give thanks to the God who gives these things to us. But your thanks must be deeper than that. And your thanks must be grounded on something deeper than simply the temporal blessings God is pleased to give to you in this life. Give thanks to the God who works all things, even pain and suffering, for good. Give thanks to the God who has given you His Son. Yes, who forsook His Son. His Son who alone could truly cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who forsook His Son, who gave Him up on the cross so that we might never more be forsaken by Him. So that we might be adopted to be His sons, His heirs, His children. So that we may come to Him and cry out, Abba, Father, give thanks for the confidence we may have that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. And give thanks that nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And give thanks in the hope of what is to come. Give thanks in the hope of the glory that is to be revealed in us. Yes, in everything give thanks, resting at peace and secure in the hands of a sovereign God and a loving Father.